Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter fan cast. Joining me, as always, is my two co-hosts, Noel. Hello. And Julia. Hi. And with us is a very special guest. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Lewis Linkara Lovehog. I host the web series Atop the Fourth Wall, where I review awful comic books every week. And I am also a big fan of John Carpenter, so there you go. Why don't you go ahead and expand on that? What is some of your history with John? Uh, I wouldn't say I have a long history with him, but The Thing is one of my favorite movies of all time. And in particular, I have done reviews of the sequel comics to The Thing, some of which are better than others. And I also really enjoy several of his other films, including the one he did for a Showtime, was it Showtime anthology? I can't remember. It was the Masters of Horror thing. I think that was Showtime. Yeah, Cigarette Burns. Prince of Darkness is a flawed movie, in my opinion, but it has a lot of wonderful atmosphere. And I especially love In the Mouth of Madness. In the Mouth of Madness seems to be like the big one for people of like our age and our generation. I think we all came in a little too late for the 80s boom of Carpenter, but then like that one hit in the mid 90s. It's also one of the few Lovecraftian kind of horror movies that's actually really succeeded. Other ones tend to be just straight up adaptations of Lovecraft versus the idea of Lovecraft. Or Reanimator where they just run off with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we should also mention you just released a film. I did, a Top the Fourth Wall of the movie, because, of course, my comic book review show has a storyline in it, and I decided to make a film version of it. Yeah, and I think this episode will be coming out afterwards, but you're working on the DVDs at the moment? I am, and hopefully this week, fingers crossed, I'll get everything finished for the DVD and send that off to be made. And then you can rest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's just move into today's subject. Well, here's a quick question. Is Body Bags a film that any of us had seen before? I have. Nope. Nope. Even as the John Carpenter fan, this is one of the few I've never seen. I had no idea this actually existed until you brought it to my attention. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Well, it was obscure for a while, and there was actually a DVD release like a decade ago, but apparently that was like a heavily edited one oh. that used like the USA basic cable edit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm laughing now because one of the, because of course one of the things that I recall specifically is so vivid in my mind right now is Mark Hamill's taint in one bit. So like yes, but they cut that out. <laughs> yes, we're gonna spread that one wide open later in the show. But, uh, oh dear lord. <laughs> I think it aired under the title of John Carpenter's Mind Games when they did a re-edit of this for USA. But yeah, so imagine this with all the gore cut out and all the butt shots. Ugh. Just to give a little history on this, as we mentioned in the last episode, this comes during a period of time which was a bit rough for Carpenter. His studio films of the 80s, while now beloved favorites, failed to take off financially. And while his two low-budget indie productions, Prince of Darkness and They Live, didn't exactly bomb, their numbers weren't also considered to be successes, which left John struggling to get projects off the ground. He ultimately returned to accepting for higher assignments when he directed Memoirs of an Invisible Man, and its failure left him returning to television for the first time since the 1970s. Body Bags came as a direct result of Tales from the Crypt, which was a huge hit for HBO and was heading into its fifth season by the end of 1993. And Lewis, I know you're a big fan of, like, anthology programs and anthology horror. And Tales from the Crypt in particular. So basically Showtime, which continues to be HBO's main rival, but was definitely so at the time, wanted in on the action, so of course they commissioned their own horror anthology series. And I'll get into the breakdowns of each segment when we get to those during the main discussion. But after these three episodes were shot, and you'll kind of notice the show is structured so that you could break it off into each of these being a half-hour episode. After these were shot, a dispute broke out between John and the other producers of the show who all wanted to continue filming in L.A. so as to maintain all the star power and celebrity cameos, and Showtime who wanted to just ship all the production to Canada. Because you Canadians stealing all of our productions and everything. We love to do it. It was ultimately decided to cancel the series, and all the existing episodes were just stitched together as an anthology film, which debuted on August 9th, 1993. 
It wouldn't take long, though, for the head writers and producers of the show, Billy Brown and Dan Angel, to get another horror anthology series off the ground, as just two years later, they were also the producers and story editors of the entirety of R.L. Stein's Goosebumps, hmm. and carried on with additional anthology shows like Night Visions, The Fearing Mind, and The Haunting Hour, as well as the kids' adventure shows The Young Blades and Animorphs. <laughs> <laughs> so this was by the head writers of Animorphs. Which could, depending on how you look at it, could be a bit of praise or a bit of derision. I look at it more as just an interesting thing. Hmm. <laughs> so John Carpenter directed two segments, The Gas Station and Hair, executive produced the project with his wife, Sandy King, and starred in the interstitial segments as the host of the show, The Coroner. And he also collaborated on the score with Jim King, with whom he'll again work on In the Mouth of Madness, before King went on to compose the entirety of Hey Arnold. <laughs> I'll mention the other segment was directed by Toby Hooper. We'll, we'll mention him later in the episode when we get to his segment. And returning from past Carpenter films, just quickly, we have cinematographer Gary Kibbe, editor Edward A. Warshilka, assistant director Artist Robinson, production designer Daniel A. Lamino, set decorator Claudia, costumer Robert Bush, location manager Kenneth Levette, half of the sound crew, and stunt coordinators Jeff Amata, Tony Brubaker, and Henry Kingy. So, any other comments or anything before we jump into the synopsis? Well, if we're going by producers and directors and whatnot, Roger Corman guest appearance in the third segment. Yeah, and actually, he did that as a favor to John, and John, to returning the favor, appears in Silence of the Hams in 1994. Because, <laughs> honestly, the only film that Corman and Carpenter ever did together was peripherally Escape from New York, where Corman's company just did the special effects. Hmm. Yeah, surprisingly, they never worked together otherwise. Well, I don't think Carpenter is known for having huge budgets for his projects. Projects, but even by Corman's standards, he probably couldn't have produced a lot under Corman's very tight-fisted kind of thing. Though, you know, I could see, like, Prince of Darkness and They Live. I could, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but again, it should be pointed out, Carpenter only did a couple films on budgets to that level and always wanted to do big studio films. Hmm. So yeah, probably only would have gone so far. And also, creative control. That would probably be a problem. Yeah. And I'll save the synopses for as we get into each segment. So why don't I just kind of ask overall, Alex, do you recommend Body Bags? I would say a soft recommend, since I got some enjoyment out of two-thirds of the overall package. There was elements to like the third installment, including Luke Skywalker's sweet, sweet buns. <laughs> yeah, I would say a soft recommend overall. I mean, Tales from the Crypt, this was not. And the Crypt Keeper, John Carpenter, is not, although I have a lot of affection for the man, and he did give it his level best. My experience with Body Bags, the first time I saw it, like you guys, I had no idea it even existed. And it was at a time when uh, my friends and I were kind of like searching the globe for various oddities. And I stumbled upon it on some sort of 10 forgotten films lists. And I'm like, what the hell is this? So I pulled it out of the vortex of the internet. And we were still a little bit confused. I'm like, what is this? It's like a Tales from the Crypt movie with John Carpenter hosting. Why have I never heard of this? And does it kind of live up to that? Not entirely, but it does definitely do its best. And one of the segments I thoroughly loved. What one is it? We'll see. Julia, do you recommend the movie? I would give it a recommend if you'd never seen anything like this before. Like if you've never seen an anthology or horror movie of any kind. Because I thought it started off really strong and then kind of, like most of them, got worse as it went along. But I really liked the first segment. I thought the second segment was charming. And the third segment wasn't terrible, just in relation to the other two. <laughs> wasn't as strong, and for some reason, twice as long. But, it's always the way it is. Yeah, it seems to be always the way it is. Oh, you don't like me? You'll be hanging out a while. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'll go with Alex's language and say soft recommend at this point. Soft recommend. Soft, downy soft recommend. That's right. Fluffy soft recommend. Affectionate recommend. And Lewis, do you recommend the movie? I'm going to actually differ with the others because I actually would especially recommend this if you're a fan of Tales from the Crypt. While I agree it's certainly not as strong as Tales from the Crypt, it's certainly in the same spirit. Although I will agree that certain segments are better than others. The gas station is really the strongest segment and definitely helped by Carpenter's own direction. And I actually found the coroner to be very charming, very Crypt Keeper-esque, and definitely not a bad makeup or humor job for a lot of this, especially in that same kind of vein. Obviously, it doesn't have quite the same budget and charm as the puppetry, and obviously not going pun wild like the Crypt Keeper, but it's fun. It keeps up the energy, especially during the host segments, and I could see any of these stories in Tales from the Crypt. 
Yeah, and I also recommend it. What I found interesting is, while I could see all of them in Tales from the Crypt, what I kind of like is that they're all like different anthologies kind of all squished together here. Like the first one, The Gas Station, I could see that as a great classic Alfred Hitchcock episode. Mm. Hair, I could see as like a charming episode of either Amazing Stories or Monsters. And then The Eye, that is definitely like a solid Tales from the Crypt, Tales from the Dark Side type one. I kind of like that it's that kind of range of tones and range of styles. And I really liked it. I don't know that it's something I'm going to dig out to rewatch every year, but I, I'm glad I watched it. I will watch it again. I think there's definitely some charm in there, and there, there are some genuinely clever and sharp moments, particularly in the first segment. I definitely recommend it. Let me just turn through the snaps real quick for the host segments, and then we'll uh, talk about those. All of these stories are related to us by the coroner, a crude and rude ghoul who molests and plays with the bodies in his care as he reveals to us how they met their fates. In a twist ending, it's revealed he himself is also a corpse in the morgue, and as the real coroners return, he resumes his place on a slab and they start digging in. By the way, did you recognize the other coroners? I know that one of them is supposed to be Toby Hooper, isn't it? Yep, the one with the beard. And I don't know who the other guy is, but I've seen him before. And this is Tom Arnold. That's Tom Arnold. Yeah. That's Tom Arnold, okay. I haven't been able to find out if these host segments were meant for the ongoing TV series, because I honestly don't know if John intended to host an entire television series by himself, <laughs> particularly because he complained he had to sit in three hours of Rick Baker makeup every day. <laughs> yeah. But I find them charming. They are definitely on paper as punny as the Tales from the Crypt, but I like that he has more an understated delivery, so they aren't as in-your-face punny. I like the storytelling engine of it, of telling the stories of the dead bodies, and there is really a charm to him just going through a line of corpses and looking like, heart attack, natural causes, pfft, who cares? <laughs> I mean, it gets maybe a little too much when he's like, you know, switching the heads of the husband and wife who died together. Or yeah, something. that's... It's crude. It's really crude humor, but it's Tales from the Crypt. Yeah. For me, the breast implant joke was like, really? Eh. Yeah. Who I thought that that had to be a dummy that they built, but no, that was an actual woman that Ron Jeremy found for them. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Well, now that I know that, those were very impressive implants. Yeah, what the <laughs> I did like the uh, less is more approach to his makeup where it looks like John Carpenter, but like skeletized a little bit. Maciated. So I did appreciate that. Yeah, emaciated. Corpse like you could say. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't dislike him, but once you go with the Crypt Keeper, there was no boils and or ghouls mentioned. I, I like the puns, <laughs> but yeah, I think he did a fine job. It just didn't land as much for me. I did like it. And I do like the twist at the end where he's one of the corpses. I thought that was great and actually made me feel less bad about all the wacky stuff he was doing with the bodies. I love that he kept waking up as they cut in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Julia, I know you've always been hesitant to actually see what John Carpenter looks like. Yeah, I'm devastated, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to find out he's a skeleton man? Well, I mean, it's probably the best case scenario where he has like a whole bunch of makeup on and he's pretending to be someone else. It's not like an interview segment or a documentary or something. But I was incredibly disappointed to see him in real life. Although his characters, I'm sure they're all like this. They don't have as much experience with all the programs that you guys watch. It felt like playing Nightmare, you know, like where you just <laughs> felt like you had to stand up and say you were youngest at some point. <laughs> Next it's, segment, you maggot. It, it definitely felt like that kind of character, which was fun. I didn't particularly dislike or like him. He was just one of those things. I guess that's maybe the problem with it is that I wasn't like overly emotional about it either way. It was just like, oh, you do you, John. Yeah. <laughs> you having fun, dear? That's mm -hmm. nice. I like that he was having fun. He did yeah. seem to be having fun. The way I would put it is I find it humorous and charming in this movie. I don't know how well it would work to see it week after week after week. He's not bad at all. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that there is this awkward natural. Like, he doesn't quite know how to sell the lines, but he just kind of does it as naturally as he can. He's not quite Sven Gulli. How many times can he drink formaldehyde? <laughs> I don't know. It, it would be interesting to receive where this would have gone had it continued with him as the host. But I don't know. It was fun, though, for what it was, because it was a nice just like a few minutes here and there. They didn't overstay their welcome for me. Yep, that's true. And again, it was just fun, crude humor, like, hey, it's the eye. Let's introduce him with googly eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like they were like, what do we have around the trailer? <laughs> yeah, or hair. He rips out a tuft of hair. Do you have anything in your car? <laughs> oh, and a lot of this was they just went to K&B, who did most of the effects, and what dummies do you have laying around? <laughs> 
Any other further comments on the host segments? No, I just really enjoyed them, man. I personally thought he did good enough, provided they, like you said, kept it relatively short. Yeah. I could see that going week after week. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they're any more stilted or awkward than the Alfred Hitchcock host segments were, which had, again, a lot of charm to them, too. Hitchcock had the benefit of also doing pretty much the same thing week after week. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here is a pun. Goodbye. It's also (laughs) fun just seeing John Carpenter do something fun. Of course, yeah, no. For, like, a wacky, like, detour in his career, it's definitely a wonderful thing to see. Yeah, and I I should say that while this was kind of a four-hire gig that he took during a period where he was having a hard time getting projects off the ground, he has nothing but love for it. Because on the DVD Blu-ray, he did new commentary for it in interviews. He always talks about how he was proud of it. He doesn't consider it one of his best works, but he had fun making it. Hmm. It seems like a fun with friends kind of thing. It does totally seem like that. It seems like a bunch of people got together and was like, I don't know, we want to do something? All right, let's figure something out, guys. Let's pay tribute to the EC memories we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, do we want to move on to the segment, The Gas Station? Let's do it. In The Gas Station, Anne is settling in for her first overnight shift at a remote gas station, dealing with odd and disquieting customers while the radio reports a killer is on the loose, in Haddonfield of all places. <laughs> Ultimately, it's Bill, her unassuming co-worker, who turns out to be the one tallying up victims as he goes after her with a sledgehammer and machete. After a few false deaths, Anne finally takes Bill down with a truck on a hydraulic lift. I love this segment. I absolutely adore this segment. It's definitely the best, and it probably helps that this is exactly in John Carpenter's wheelhouse, Mm -hmm. dealing with people alone in an isolated environment. Loved it. I wish it could have been longer. My only real concern with it or uh, issue I have with it is it played its hand a bit too early with the reveal of the killer. I could have done a whole hour and a half of escalating terror from like the discovery of the drawing on the bathroom wall, just kind of like realization that that killer is actually in the gas station. But as an exercise in tension, it's wonderful. Loved it. I fear it would have overstayed its welcome if it went on too long because there were a lot of false scares in it. You know, standard issue jump scares, someone walks past the camera and loud jump of music. And I fear that if they had tried to stretch that out for an hour, hour and a half, then it probably wouldn't have had the same effect. They would have had to have either another person come by to talk for a longer period of time. Or just would have been like, okay, move on, get on with it kind of a thing if we had tried to do any more with it. You know, I could actually see it expand. I mean, like not much more than like 80 minutes, but I could see them playing with the characters a bit more, especially with the bum in the bathroom. I could see having a segment in the middle where she calls Billy for help and he actually comes and then leaves again and then comes back in the end, revealing as the killer. I could see that. I could see them building a story out of this. I'm still very happy with what they got. It would have been tricky to maintain this for like an hour and a half, but I could see them do it because I've seen other films do this too. Which, by the way, I called Bill as the killer as soon as I saw him. <laughs> uh, I didn't. Mostly it was how surprised he was in seeing that I think her name was Anne, was it? Yeah. Yeah, that Anne was there because that seems like kind of thing. I mean, sure, if he had turned out not to be the killer, that would have been fine. But just seeing how surprised he was and seeming kind of shifty and and being just a little too charming. He didn't try to hit on her or anything like that. Right. I noticed that on my second viewing was, yeah, you have that bit where he just kind of looks up at her. It didn't click for me until my second viewing that, okay, he never even worked at the gas station in the first place. He killed the guy who worked there. Mm. He's just the killer. Yep. And poor Sam Raimi. (laughs) Stuck in that locker. (laughs) He's always getting killed. I think it definitely could have been actually a feature length movie and I would have really liked it. One of my favorite things about John Carpenter is how easily he can write dialogue and make simple scenes feel so real and like engaging. So I would have really, really have actually loved to see this in a feature length, especially with a character like Anne, who is fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. And like, (laughs) you hardly ever see characters like that. So it would have been really wonderful. I would have watched a whole side story where she talked to her mother for half an hour on the phone. (laughs) I would have liked watched a whole thing where like, an ex-boyfriend comes and harasses her or you know like dealing with the bum could have been a whole separate thing definitely agree with alex that the reveal was played a little bit early but there mm-hmm. was a time restraint like if you have to do it in half an hour you kind of have to get to the blood because mm-hmm. <laughs> i know that's what people want to right they don't want to just watch some woman talking to people in a gas station unlike me <laughs> <laughs> and that's where i feel if you make this a feature and you bring billy back at some point in the middle you could play that in a way that kind of misdirects away from him again oh for definitely. sure because there wasn't that many options for who the killer actually was, right? I do like that each gas station customer was creepy in their own right. They Mm -hmm. had different things about them that you could say, well, it's not really that creepy and other ones saying much more creepy, varying levels of it. They were played ambiguous. Oh, for sure. And I actually, at the beginning, I thought she was going to turn out to be the murderer.
murderer. Just the way they played her watching the guy leave, the mm-hmm. way they like kept holding on her face, watching him get in his car and like slowly drive away. And the fact that she was so confident, like, I got this, no problem. This is where this is. This is where that is. Yeah, Great. I've done this before. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I'm like, that would Literally. be kind of cool if that's who it was. It was nice that everyone was shady. Mm-hmm. And I totally yeah. think that you could have played that out over time and even like someone nice then turning mm-hmm. a little bit evil. Like, I liked the idea a lot. Where is the homeless man at any point in this? Yeah. Like, yeah. she never knows exactly where he is. I love that she like makes mistakes. She learns from her mistakes. The key. She does not forget it a second time. Yeah. yeah. You know, then she grabs the wrench at one point. Yeah. yeah. Just see how long you can maintain that tension. I would yeah. just slow it down. Which is funny because they established the wrench and I thought they were establishing the wrench as like a murder weapon later on to be used against her or something. Hmm. That's true. I could definitely see that. But that's the thing I love about Carpenter. No, instead he pulls out a sledgehammer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love the shots of him pounding through that glass. Which seems yeah. just slightly unrealistic to me. I don't know. He doesn't seem like the type who would be strong enough to break through the glass even with a sledgehammer. It's stressed a little bit. I could see it a little bit considering you know, it's probably at a cheap gas station. He did go at it for a while though. That was like yeah. a dozen yeah, That is true. That is true. He punched like 20 <laughs> holes in it before he got through. Yeah. <laughs> and then he finally breaks through the door as well and manages to get legitimately knocked out. Like that looked good. I love that face. It. All these times where you like see people or they're like bashing over the head and they're just like I'm fine I'm shaking it off but he's like on the floor like with his hands disoriented shaking, yeah disoriented yep. falls down again no the, her trust in him being passed out whatever but it was a cool shot I would jump on his head <laughs> yeah <laughs> I would well you, you know, even then after he got up that first time I wouldn't have taken my eyes off of him no. yeah. that's true <laughs> Walk backwards down the highway. Yeah. <laughs> Although I like, I like it's a very Halloween shot where she's yes. looking away, breathing, catching her breath, and then him getting up. That was definitely like 100% Halloween. Yeah, for sure. I love that David Naughton, the American werewolf of London guy, the handsome guy, the flirty guy with the fancy car and the credit card, he ultimately comes in and helps save the day. Yep. Mm-hmm. I just really love the cast in this. I mean, Alex Dasher as Anne was such a great lead. I want to see her in more things. Mm-hmm. I'm glad Drunken Guy was actually half decent. Well, and that's George Buck Flowers, who this is like his fifth Carpenter film now. Oh, nice. Because <laughs> he plays the drunken bum. He's the bum on the bench in Back to the Future. He is the drunken bum of every film in the 80s. Oh, not the bum, the drunken driver guy with the girlfriend. Well, yes, the drunken bum was good because, again, he had his own form of creepiness going for him, and you can understand. But I like drunken guy who's all, oh, I didn't explain it. And it's like, he doesn't try to hit on her. He's just like, you think a suspicious guy in the bathroom? I'm gonna go check on him for you. And then exactly like a drunk person does nothing. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and says, see ya. All talk. <laughs> and as with Buck Flowers, that is Peter Jason. This is about his fifth film with John Carpenter. He will do it more. <laughs> The one thing that threw me was he said that the guy was curled around the toilet. I had no choice, but the piss over his head. There were two toilets in that bathroom. <laughs> and a hole outside. <laughs> there were two toilets <laughs> and a urinal. Come on. If it's between going outside to take a whiz and peeing over a man, I would choose outside. Use the sink. Use the sink. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the one thing that does confuse me. When Anne goes in the bathroom and sees the graffiti, she's really horrified and shocked by it. Maybe it's just that she's been under a little bit of stress, but she's even really shocked by that. And I'm like, have you never been to a gas? station bathroom before. I don't know. I'm looking at that true. piece of art. Have you never been on DeviantArt? <laughs> that is a lovely piece that would get quite a few likes. Mm. I feel like they did the shot of her reacting to it and then filled in the art later. So she was just doing her best. <laughs> she's like, react like it's something horrific. And she's like, I got this because I'm amazing. And then when they did the pickup shot of the actual art that it was being shown, they were like, oh, we didn't prepare for this, guys. <laughs> like before, she was just reacting to like a butt. Yeah, <laughs> she's reacting to nothing. She's just being an actor. <laughs> the camera's on her. There's not looking at anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of expected more of her kind of a thing if it was like very specific towards her, like Hello Anne or something like that. But yeah. it's very detailed artwork, I'll admit. But it's graffiti in a bathroom. I expect to be kind of weird and kind of graphic at times, too. It seemed like a Stephen King scene to me. Like in a Stephen King book, they would describe that where the character sees like something like that and you'd explain it in detail. That's basically a scene from Clive Barker's Candyman, too. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely, where they kind of react to it. But it is our reaction should be stronger than what hers is. But what I love is that the cup of markers is still there. Ah, I didn't notice that. That's true. I think maybe they were trying to establish it, like, perchance in an earlier rite or something, she went into the bathroom beforehand and there wasn't any graffiti there. 
because the markers being there basically is kind of indicating that it was done very recently mm. and that maybe her reaction was double fold in the fact that it was very recently. So maybe it was the bum or whoever it was, but that someone had been there and she hadn't known. That would have been a good idea for establishing it. Yeah. What I liked about it not being like Anne specific in terms of referencing her is that it's again played ambiguously. This could be something that's dangerous, but it could also just be something there could just be a local teenager who likes to express himself and no one has an appreciation of his talent yet. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you completely because what I liked about this was everything was like maybe like there was jump scares, but there was also scares of just like a guy walking by in the background mm -hmm. or walking up towards her slowly. So I like that ambiguity and I wish they had kept that longer. Is there someone there? Is there not? As she gets more and more frightened and maybe she does something stupid in that case. See, and one other thing that I like is that John kind of shook up his style a little bit here because he's not filming an animal. Like I know, Lewis, you and I were working off of the DVD and Blu-ray where they have cropped it to be widescreen. Hmm. This was filmed full screen, which I know Alex and Julia, you saw that version. He kind of shook up his shooting style a little bit because, you know, John likes to work in anamorphic. So with the square lens, he decided to go handheld for a lot of shots instead of dollies. Like when she's in the garage, it's a handheld camera on a wide angle, just getting up in her face and swirling around. That's not a style that he usually uses, but I love how he said on the commentary that was something he got to play with. Hmm. Bill's a squirter. Yeah. <laughs> that car drops on him and he just gushes. <laughs> what did that even hit that would cause that reaction? <laughs> it's maybe a medical thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's K and B. It doesn't have to make anatomical sense. But I gotta say, I loved Robert Carradine as Bill. He got into that role so much. He did, yeah. He turns on a dime. I know he's famous for Revenge of the Nerds, but I know him so much as being the dad on Lizzie McGuire. <laughs> this was so weird to see him in. One of the things that I really liked is that we play with the... I mean, we seem to establish early on that she should theoretically be safe in the gas station booth. Because, of course, you can tell it's like bulletproof glass kind of a thing. And when she is at first locked out, it's like, oh, crap, he's going to get chased around and she can't escape back to the safe spot kind of a thing. But then even when she gets inside, he pulls the sledgehammer like, oh, crap, there is no safe spot. <laughs> and what I love is she does successfully manage to call 911 and that still doesn't help her. Well, it doesn't help her because she hangs up suddenly. I mean, like I said, it takes a few whacks to get inside. She could I just got that she set the phone down. She could. I mean, I know she was panicking at that point, but still. <laughs> just yell out the address at that point. Just say gas station, this highway, please come. <laughs> and then run. Gas station, he's going to kill me. <laughs> yeah. But what I liked about this one is that it also doesn't have any supernatural twist. It's a mm. very tight thrill. Yep. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just think it's a wonderfully crafted story. And I would be curious to know how, because I know Carpenter is not credited as writing any of these segments. I did not find a copy of the script, so I don't know if he like did anything uncredited. This feels so John Carpenter, and it also reminds me, Alex and Julia, you might remember a while back, I wrote a review on the site for an early script that he wrote in the 70s called Prey, mm -hmm. where it's, you know, three women trapped on a mountain with a killer. There are so many echoes of that, especially the fact that Prey ended with a big fight in a garage with slipping in oil, swinging around wrenches, and ultimately beating the killer by squishing him under a hydraulic car press. I feel like he did a pass. He must yeah. have. Or a pseudonym or something. Especially with the Haddonfield references. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Maybe he's also a writer for Animorphs. To be fair, the Haddonfield reference feel more like someone is like, hey, John Carpenter just signed on to direct. Let's make references to Haddonfield. <laughs> Especially when we're talking about the writers of Goosebumps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this one, you could just take this segment alone. And it would be a marvelous work of John Carpenter. Mm -hmm. Yep. While I'm kind of a soft recommend on the entire movie, I heavily recommend, especially fans of John Carpenter, watch this segment. I'm a full recommend for this one. Agreed. Definitely. Gas Station is just a marvelous piece of thriller filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Loved it. And by the way, did anyone recognize who was playing the pasty-faced man? The first creepy guy we encountered. I got some bourbon in my car. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, was that Wes Craven? That was the late, great Wes Craven. Uh, I knew it. I thought so. I thought yeah. he looked familiar. And I should mention that at one point, Wes Craven was in talks. I don't know if it was for Gas Station or Hair, but he was in talks to direct one of the three segments. So it was going to be an anthology horror film with John Carpenter, Toby Hooper, and Wes Craven. That would have been nice. But he was just coming off of his own TV show, Nightmare Cafe, which had just been canceled. I loved Nightmare Cafe. And had just gotten the green light to begin production work on New Nightmare. So he wasn't able to commit to this, but he still came out to film that cameo. Well, he did well because, like I said, varying levels of creepy, and yeah. he started off with the creepiness right off the bat. <laughs> and just kept cranking it up. 
<laughs> Especially love when he's driving away and he just looks back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else anyone wants to add before we jump to hair? Uh, nope. Watch it. Hmm. In Hair, Richard Coberts is becoming increasingly disillusioned by his thinning scalp and what this means about his manly appeal. After trying every volumizer to pay paint and styling gel on the market, he sees an ad where Dr. Locke promises a new technique to restore a full head of hair. Richard goes through with the procedure, which overnight leaves him with the shoulder-length mane of a romance novel model. This instantly boosts the confidence of Richard, not to mention his sex life with his girlfriend, but come the next day, the hair won't stop growing. It starts popping out in new places, his cheeks, his eyelids from inside his mouth, and when he cuts it, the shorn follicles shriek at him and find new places on his body to burrow into. Returning to the office to confront Dr. Locke, he finds out he's just one in a wave of victims of an alien invasion, using male vanity to make us into their food source as the hair starts feeding on his brain. So what did we think of hair? I like this one, not as much as the first one, uh, but I did find it quite charming. I like the first half because it has a lot of Carpenter's patented snappy dialogue that really worked. As it got into the actual plot of it, it's a bit silly, but I was still on board. I still like it. It's more like a more lighthearted, like a night gallery, kind of like one of the sillier Dr. Acula type sketches. Yeah, that's where I was like Amazing Stories or Monsters. I don't know if anyone remembers Monsters. I don't remember that one. I could see Monsters. That one had that famous Stephen King episode where it's the finger in the in the sink drain. Oh, yeah, I know that story. Julia, what did you think of this one? Well, I agree with Alex. I thought that the whole part leading up to the reveal was really charming. I really liked the main actor and the actress. I actually really liked the whole thing because it was silly, but also really well done. And I liked the actor too. The, the fact that he could sell talking to himself in a mirror, which is not easy to do mm -hmm. <laughs> as an actor was great. And I thought it was all very lighthearted and fun. The thing that was weird though, is I felt like I knew exactly what was going to happen because I felt I had seen it before. But after I watched the whole thing, I realized I'd actually seen another one. And I think it must have been a Stephen King one where the guy grows all this hair and then eventually he like shoots himself in the face oh, with a shotgun. Oh, where he gets all the plants on that's him? That's Creepshow. Is that Creepshow? I figured you guys would know what it was. <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually moss and not hair, but the Is same general principle. Okay. Yeah. That's what I, I imagine. I remembered it being hair. <laughs> yeah, no, no. That's definitely a fitting reference. So that's what I pictured when I was watching that. And it did kind of have more of like a Stephen Kingy feel to it to me than a John Carpenter feel. It definitely felt like a Nightmares and Dreamscapes type of thing, like Noel said with the finger story, which terrified me, by the way. Nightmares and Dreamscapes, I listened to that on audio tape. <laughs> I do not recommend that, or I really recommend it. It depends on whether how like, much you like being scared. How much you like being scared. And Lewis, what do you think of it? I found this one to be just okay. I definitely feel it's the weakest of the three segments. Uh, the problem is, for me, it feels like it really goes on too long. I knew it was going. Well, at least I know partly where it was going. I knew, of course, that eventually the hair would be too much and, you know, cause problems. Didn't see the aliens twist part. <laughs> I expected more Sasquatch than that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I expected a lot more kind of a Sasquatchy thing and maybe a different sort of explanation. But he himself was charming. That's definitely one of the positives I can give to all three segments. The main character in none of them is unlikable. He's just a guy who's really feeling down about losing his hair and feeling like he's getting older and losing his masculinity by a loss of hair. And yet the story seems to be really pushing towards a different direction kind of a thing with this, especially with the reveal. David Warner, it was kind of pushing him away at one point. So I'm not sure what was the deal with that. It's called sales. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta make them want it. Yeah. <laughs> and then you make them seem like they can't have it, and all of a sudden, then they really want it. <laughs> but while I don't think it was that great overall, I definitely have to give props to the makeup and effects, especially to the tiny hair creatures, especially when they move on their own after being cut off. That was some great stop motion. Hmm very seamless in a few spots. Oh, yeah. But it just feels like it just goes on a little too long because I figured I knew where it was going. And his girlfriend, who is supportive for a good chunk of it, really seems to be showing empathy for him at one point. But then when she accidentally kisses his hair with the paint on it or whatever that hair replacement stuff was, then she seems to be like, you know, maybe we need a break. Yeah, it felt like they just kind of needed to write her out of the story. And I'm not entirely certain what it is about the alien hair that makes it so attractive to people. Dude, the problem is not that you're losing your hair. It's that you look like you're 40 or 50. <laughs> yeah. I'm conflicted on this one because my main problem with this one is I think it has a weak payoff. 
I think the whole, oh, it's an alien invasion and we're really parasites to eat your brain. It feels like they kind of wrote themselves into a corner and just kind of whipped that out at the last second. Because I, I love the build of it. I actually love the first 20 minutes of it. It's a marvelous character study. It's marvelously well executed. I love how warm it is. It doesn't feel like a horror story at all. It's mm. a warm character comedy. This feels like it could be the beginning of a sweet 80s rom-com about, I found a way to get hair back. Now it won't stop growing. Will anyone <laughs> love me? Yes, I guess I will still love you, even if you're covered with hair. Because I loved you when you had no hair. Like, I figured it would fit better that type of a story. I want to watch that movie. <laughs> than ultimately paying off as a part of a horror anthology. It felt out of place. The alien's twist felt out of place because yeah. there's no other hinting of that kind of a thing up until that point. Quite the opposite, actually. Because of the lead-in segment, I thought he was going to jump out the window because they showed the bag of guts beforehand. <laughs> I guess I can't remember exactly what he said, but I'm like, oh, that must be what's about to happen. What I think would have been a better twist with it, that all the various chemicals and products that he put onto his head screwed up the process and thus created this hair life form. Ah. That would be good. So it's like he created this form of sentience by mixing all the chemicals together. Yeah, because he was just so desperate to have that. It's a be careful what you wish for kind of a thing. With how much he kept trying and so many different things, he ended up creating his own monster. Yeah, and what if, like, the hair gains sentience and it's just like he ultimately just has to live with his hair? Yeah. But again, I feel like this is a story that shouldn't take a horrific twist. It should take a charming twist. Mm. And it doesn't. The build to it is so loving and warm. And I love Stacey Keach's performance. I love his performance. I mean, I think it holds for, like, three minutes, just a single take of him looking in the mirror as he's unwrapping the bandages. Yeah. And seeing the long hair for the first time. I love his performance, and it's funny, it's winking, but it's also sincere. I don't know, I question whether they maybe rewrote the ending, because it had to fit in in a horror anthology, and that perchance mm -hmm. it was more of a witty, like, the whole beginning, and had more of a fun ending, but then they're like, no, no, you have to make it horrific, mm -hmm. because otherwise we're not going to include it. So they kind of like, they're like, okay, well then, uh, the aliens, okay, good, <laughs> go. Hey, <laughs> aliens. And that's where it feels kind of abrupt. Like, it just kind of suddenly takes that turn. Yeah, he just kind of sits down and that's it. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, because the hair aliens have burrowed into his brain are now, like, he's in, like, catatonic state. But again, the makeup job for him is really damn good. I really like that. The makeup is very nice. There's one shot of, like, the hair moving through him like veins, and it's a very good shot. Where it starts poking through, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I love the highly sexed nurse. Yeah. <laughs> she was great. By the way, did anyone recognize the nurse? I did, but I, I, did, I forgot to look up... Twig she right? was. No, no, that's the last girl. Twiggy's coming up in the next one. That was uh, Debbie Harry, the lead singer of Blondie. Oh, <laughs> because I'm like, oh, that looks... See, I should have gone with my first guess. Yeah. You want something even wilder? His girlfriend is the famous singer Sheena Easton. I saw her in the credits. I couldn't place who she was. The Scottish singer Sheena Easton. This is one of her few acting jobs, and she does a great New York accent. Yeah, she did a really good job. Yeah, she did. I should also mention when he's looking at the three people walking down the street with the long hair flowing... The long-haired blonde man with his dog, that is Greg Nicotero, the makeup effects guy, with his real oh, hair. Amazing. By the way, that dog was, that was hilarious, I'll give you that. <laughs> See, and I even love, there, there is such a sharp wit to it, and I love that it's such a different thing for John Carpenter to do as a director. But it was like Zuma Beach or Better Late Than Ever, where it's like you see him kind of excelling at something that you wouldn't expect him to. Mm -hmm. A warm romantic comedy. And that's also kind of why I was disappointed by the ending, because I wanted to see more of that first part. And I love scenes like there was that great bit where she kisses his head and gets the hair paint on her lips or the great scene where he's getting the pitch in the office and the sexy nurse is just kind of sitting there just throwing in like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that would be great. Oh, yes, yeah, so you want that, you know. <laughs> and she's like practically grinding on him. Yeah. <laughs> but that's how you get him. Yeah. He's vain. <laughs> yeah, no, and I love that David Warner is just this boring doctor who has his procedure and she's the real sales gimmick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have to say it was it was amusing of a story and wonderfully relatable because I am balder at 33 than Stacy Keach is at 52 in this. <laughs> and what I loved in the commentary, because they got Stacy Keach to do the commentary for this one with Carpenter. Wonderful commentary. I highly recommend it. Where he was like, for most of his career, his dad kind of goaded him into, you have to wear a piece, you have to cover your bald spot or else you won't get your jobs. He loved that this segment was kind of a way to just kind of purge that and just kind of like accept the fact that he's bald by just doing mm -hmm. a story that brings it front and center. I was going nice. to say, and showcase how ridiculous he looks with a full head of hair, because <laughs> he looked like future Tommy Wiseau, basically. <laughs> Great wig work, though. Great wig work. It did look like it was actually his hair. Yeah. Yep. And I love the relationship between him and Megan in that they're not a married couple. 
but also they don't seem like someone who just started dating. They feel like they've been together for a long time, but they're still keeping it casual. They still don't live together. And yet they have this familiarity, this comfort with one another. Mm -hmm. No, they were really good. Yeah, that's also why I was kind of a little disappointed that suddenly she's kind of written out of the story as, oh, she's jealous and believes he's with other women. Yeah. She had to go for the sole point that she would have him in the hospital. She uh, would yeah. have yeah. helped. Yeah. And that would have stopped the story. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And that's where it felt odd, like where he's saying he's sick. It would have felt more natural for her to be like, okay, I'm coming over. I'll check on you. I think they kind of set that up, though, in the fact that she is so supportive and like really doesn't care, emphatically telling him how much she doesn't care, tries to help him when he tells him how upsetting it is for her. But he's so focused on it that she's just kind of like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Like where every waking moment is about this obsession that he has. So I think that when he was like, oh, now I have this great hair, but now all of a sudden I'm sick. She's like, oh, I see. It's like that, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why she's being a little pissy with him and thinking that he was cheating on her or doing whatever it was that she thought that he was doing. And I think a more natural way to do that. Because there's that bit where he shows up with the hair and she's like suddenly entranced by it and attracted to it. And they go and have a wonderful night of sex. It should be more she sees him like that, realizes you just won't let this go. Mm -hmm. And is just more upset by it and just leaves him then. Or just a work trip. And you could have it be that he starts calling her for help, but she starts rebuffing him. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what she's the most turned on about is his confidence. It's the fact that he believes that he's attractive. The thing that she felt he was this whole time mm -hmm. is like such a turn on to her that he's finally reciprocating the way that she felt about him back. Yeah. yeah. That's the part that was the and most And he shut up about, about his hair for a second. Exactly. Yeah. He just mm. shut up so <laughs> they could get the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but he wouldn't. Ever since he got the long hair, he will not leave a mirror. It's true. He is always just looking at himself in a mirror stroking his own hair. So I could imagine <laughs> that also being something like, really? Really? Mm. <laughs> And by the way, I love Dan Blom as the hairstylist. Oh, he's yeah, great. He's good too. Yeah. Honestly, when I saw it, I had to go and look it up. Is that Kato Kalen? Because my God, he looks like Kato Kalen. That is not Kato Kalen. <laughs> Who is he? For a second, I thought he was Nuclear Man. He's a male model. He's only been in a few things. Right around this time, he did a Wes Craven produced film called Mind Ripper. I don't know what Mind Ripper is. <laughs> <laughs> he did that, a couple episodes of Baywatch, and that's about it. Stacey Keach threw me off at first because his voice sounded a lot like Colonel Mustard from Clue at one or two points. Oh, yeah. I always think Stacey Keach is Powers Booth and vice versa <laughs> whenever <laughs> I see them. Yeah, and it's so weird having a Tom Atkins role that's not being played by Tom Atkins in a John Carpenter movie. It was a very Tom Atkins role. But you know the reason why they couldn't go Tom Atkins? Why is that? He still has a full head of hair. <laughs> uh, of course he is. Well, Stacey Keach brought a real warmth to the role that made it really nice. I liked it. And, you know, even though I have problems with the ultimate reveal, again, yeah, the effects of the hair is such a striking image. We had a debate going, Julia was correct that it was stop motion. I'm just like, early CGI, early CGI. Yeah, no, it's stop motion, yeah. It was very good stop motion, though. It's very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now that I know it's stop motion, I'm like, A+. plus. It probably helps that the hairs are much thinner kind of a thing versus, you know, a larger, detailed kind of a creature. Yeah. Mm, for sure. The guy who did that, Jim Danforth, he did effects for Never Ending Story, the Twilight Zone movie, <laughs> Prince of Dark. Darkness. He was an ILM guy from Memoirs of Invisible Man, too. So he, oh, one of his very first things was he did effects for Dark Star. So that's probably why I kept working with Carpenter. Mm. Hey, I need someone who can do some really complex stop motion cheap. I got you, John. <laughs> I still, though, enjoyed it because while it's kind of awkward, it doesn't ultimately come together. I love those first few minutes. I just, I love it as just a nice character piece. Yeah, I liked having fun and seeing the old nice bantery kind of Carpenter things that I, I loved from his lighter fare. Any last comments before we uh, move over to the next segment? Nope. Nope. Okay. In I, Brent Matthews is a professional baseball player whose wife just learned she's pregnant. One night, he gets into a car accident, which costs him an eye. Desperate to maintain his living in order to support his growing family, he agrees to an experimental eye transplant. The operation is a success, fully restoring his vision, but as he heals, he begins experiencing visions of slain and buried women, as well as violent personality shifts in how he treats his wife. Demanding answers from the doctor, Brent learns his eye came from a serial killer who was executed on death row. Despite this, the personality overwhelms him and he violently attacks his wife until she reminds him of who he is, leading Brent to drive a pair of shears through his newly transplanted eye. Alex, what did you think of this one? I like that we all have differing opinions on the strengths and weaknesses of each of these things, and I know that we're in a safe place here, so I'm going to say I do not recommend this, and found it to be the weakest installment in the movie. 
I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the serial killer body part controlling someone is something I've seen too many times, which I don't know if it's really the fault of this movie, yeah. but it did take away a lot of my enjoyment, and I found it to be a bit too long. We kept going back to the reactions of his wife, who really, really should have gotten out of that situation a lot sooner, or gotten him a lot more help a lot sooner, and I found that to be a bit distracting for myself as well. Again, take him to the hospital. Exactly. Mm. But on the other hand, there was some really cool things going on. Like a woman coming out of the garden was super unexpected, very frightening, very striking image. So there was definitely a lot of pros. And I loved Mark Hamill's performance. And yeah, it just did not work for me like the other two did. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way. <laughs> it was way too long. Way too long. It really dragged. And I don't know why that was. I don't know whether it was because... Now, I can say all different kinds of reasons. It doesn't matter. It is the exact same running time as all the others. It felt like forever. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> it felt like it was good double the amount of time that the other ones were. Which means... It wasn't that good. <laughs> like, that's just mathematical fact that if you're like, wow, is this over yet? It's <laughs> probably not that good. <laughs> but yeah, I agree with Alex. Like, I haven't seen that many horror things, but I've seen the serial killer body part scenario at least three times and heard of it and more, I'm sure. So you know what's going to happen. He's going to get the eye transplant. It's going to be a murderer. He's going to turn into a murderer. <laughs> and then that does happen. I will say the lady coming out of the ground was pretty cool. And Mark Hamill's butt was a surprise. Like how nice it was or that it was there? That it existed. That it was there. That I could see it. That it was in front of me. That I experienced it. Luke Skywalker does indeed possess an ass. There it is. <laughs> I've seen it. And yeah, I had a lot of problems with the wife and her attitude towards things, her behavior and reactions to things were curry gray. Where it's just like, girl, you gotta get out of that house. What are you doing? Call a friend. Why did you come back alone? Take your man to the hospital. Anyways, yeah, agree. <laughs> I echo a lot of the sentiments that they have, of course, but this is a story we have seen a million times before. It's your Twilight Zone dead man's shoes kind of a thing. I think it definitely excels on its own right in, in some new ways. The two alternating eyes, especially how bloodshot yeah. and dark the serial killer eye is, definitely helps this one in terms of imagery because it clearly shows a much darker influence on him. And, of course, there's lots of gory imagery shown throughout. Plus, I think this is the first time in a horror movie that someone reaches into a garbage disposal and doesn't get their hand chopped off. <laughs> Good point. That's because we already saw the blood hand coming out of it. But yeah. I know, but that, that's the thing. A hand comes out of there as yeah. opposed to going in. <laughs> I love the backstory on that, too. Well, first he tried to dispose of his victims with the garbage disposal. Then he just buried them in the garden. Well, he tried. <laughs> it's like, okay. A.K.A. he got lazy. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I agree. I think it's not badly done. But it is such a by-the-numbers plot that, again, we've seen before, we can tell every beat that's coming, like, oh, he's putting up the crib. Oh, yeah, that's the serial killer's mom. Okay, yeah, she's blonde. Everyone that he's killing is blonde. His wife is blonde. Yep. My main problem with it is just so dark and nasty. It ends very darkly. I mean, usually these kind of stories, they do it by, like, if it's like a possessed hand transplant, they chop off the hand. Or yeah. the Simpsons parody of it, they just pull off the hair. This is a very downer ending for this kind of story. Even just the intensity of the ending where he's, like, literally calling his wife a whore while dragging her into the kitchen and tying her to the table by her hair. Mm -hmm. It's not scary. It's just ugly and just so unpleasant. Yeah, I was just waiting for credits. And like the whole scene where, you know, he's having sex with his wife and then starts raping her while visualizing what the guy was like when he molested the corpses and mm -hmm. and then bites open her shoulder. And it's like, it's not a bad character study, but it's just ugly and unpleasant. Yeah, he goes full Cape Fear and then all she does is sleep on the couch. And given how playful this movie has been up to this point. Yeah, to go from the super fun, like, I'm growing hair in places to, yeah. I'm going to to rape my wife like a murderer now. <laughs> yeah. Not so much. Like he raped corpses, you know, yeah. Mm. Yeah, guys, yeah. <laughs> you know, yes, you can do that successfully in certain horror stories and dark thrillers, but it felt so tonally out of place in this. Even Gas Station, despite the fact that it was a very slick and moody thriller, was fun. Yeah. And had this kind of playful wink to it. 
This one doesn't have a playful. It's just nasty. Well, I'd say it has a playful wink. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like they like wanted to pick something safer. I don't know. This is totally just an opinion, but like they wanted something safe for Mark Hamill to do. But then they also wanted him to be able to like explore his acting potential showcase, yeah. and showcase. And so they're like, okay, so now we're going to get a wide range out of him. And they just went too far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is very well acted. I'll give it that. And it was like a bunch of people like gave a bunch of info and they're like, yeah, man, Mark, go for it. Go for it. I think it's going to be great. And he does do a great performance, but it doesn't fit tonally with the rest of the stories or even with this story because yeah. it's just... Yeah. He's at 11 the yeah, whole time. Yeah, he's at 11 the whole time. Mm. I love his performance there at the end when he's doing the monologue. I don't love the scene, but just how committed he is to that performance is impressive to see as an actor. Mm-hmm. But my main problem with his performance is for this entire thing, between the mustache and the southern accent, I could not stop thinking of Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> I just couldn't. You know, I see it now. <laughs> I don't even mean that as a joke. I just could not get that out of my head. It's Mark Hamill as Jeff Foxworthy. We're not as familiar of the blue collar comedy tour up in the snowy <laughs> norths, but I can see what you're saying. <laughs> oh my God, evil Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> <laughs> that in itself is pretty good. I like that. <laughs> but yeah, on the lighter side of things, I'm all for equal opportunity nudity, but it's not even that we saw his butt. It's that in several shots, we could see his balls too. <laughs> I yeah. totally told Alex. That is not a I'm thing like, that I really thought I'd be seeing today. I saw nuts, Alex. I totally saw nuts. Yeah. He's like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. I'm like, I did. Not Luke Skywalker. I saw nuts, and I don't just mean the psychosis. <laughs> I saw it. I can't watch the new Star Wars movies the same way. <laughs> so that's the origin of BB-8. Yeah. <laughs> we saw his lightsaber and his Dago balls. <laughs> well, you know, I love, though, that while his wife is climbing out from under him, he's, like, forcefully kind of planking, like, keeping his body stiff so that he won't roll over and his dick will whip out. <laughs> Well, you don't want to give away the whole show. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just a weird segment. And again, that there was no evil machinations behind the scientist. It was just, oh, the donor just happened to be a serial killer. Yeah, like you say, it's just a bit too derivative. Yeah. I, I still yeah. say that hair is weaker overall in terms of its story, but this was not a pleasant segment. Yeah, and it should be noted that this one was the only segment of the movie that was directed by Toby Hooper, who, of course, is famous for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Salem's Lot, Poltergeist. And Croc. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because this was coming on the tail end of a really rough time in his career, because right after Poltergeist, he had the trio of canon films, Life Force, Invaders from Mars, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which all basically burned his reputation to the ground. And it took years before he got another movie made. And this is just following, like, years and years and years of doing TV. Like, he did an episode of Amazing Stories, The Equalizer, Haunted Lives, True Ghost Stories. He did a Tales from the Crypt episode before this. And right after this, he then did his own anthology film, Night Terrors. (laughs) And then he tried to get back into movies. Like, his big thing right after this was The Mangler. Oh, God, really? Yeah, and (laughs) Toby's never really quite managed to reclaim the highs that he started with. This movie is very much representative of his style of just very shrill, very in-your-face, kind of crank everything up to 11 of nastiness. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be fair, that's what made Texas Chainsaw Massacre so memorable, was just how intense and in-your-face it was. Absolutely. Would this have been better if it wasn't associated with this movie? I don't know, because again, the big thing about this movie, and we'll just kind of get a little overall here, is it's three segments that were meant to be three separate episodes of a TV series. Mm. Because, you know, a lot of anthology shows will, like, have a very divergent tone from episode to episode. Like, if you watch three Twilight Zones back-to-back, you'll get kind of a lovable whimsical comedy, you'll get, like, a hard sci-fi concept, and then you'll get, like, pure horror. Like X-Files with Home. Oh, God, yeah. Mm. Even Tales from the Crypt would have just very divergent tones and styles and same with Amazing Stories. Yeah, which I suppose might have been the entire idea, because if they were trying to sell this as a series, they want to tell different kind of stories for each one to show the kind of range for it. Which is great for a pilot, but I don't know, as a film, that is what ultimately keeps me from like being like, yeah, everyone has to absolutely go out and see this, because stylistically, it's so different from the two John Carpenter ones that came before it, instead of like being in the middle there. Could you even rearrange these to get a better structure for the movie? Because I don't know that having I anywhere else in the film wouldn't just hurt the film even more. Yeah, having it be first would definitely put things off the wrong tone, maybe in the middle. Maybe Because the then middle. you have a very dark thing in the middle, but then you go lighter in the end. Mm-hmm. Or would you start with hair, do I, and then end with gas station? I wouldn't end with gas station. But then that's the problem, is that then you're opening with your strongest thing first. Well, yeah. Well, I always feel you should open with your strongest thing, because then you keep people in 
interested in seeing the rest. Yeah, but then you can also let down. Somebody's watching me style. Would it have changed had Wes Craven come in and directed one of the segments instead? You never know. Mm. I almost wish this was just a one-hour pilot where it's just hair and gas station and just kind of I I don't know. Because again, it's not that I is terrible. It just it feels so out of place. I'd like to also add that when I said somebody's watching me, I meant to say when a stranger calls mm. as front-loaded. <laughs> Yeah, though, you know, this isn't unsimilar to, I mean, like, especially Gas Station is very similar to Songs Watching. Mm -hmm. Also to talk about, I, again, celebrity cameos, did anyone notice the doctor who did the transplant? I know Roger Corman was the doctor who recommended against it. Who was right. the doctor who actually did the transplant? That is John Agar. Oh. <laughs> One of the stars of all the old 50s sci-fi movies. Let's see, he was in Revenge of the Creature, Tarantula, The Mole People, The Brain from Planet Aro. <laughs> Attack of the Puppet People, Destination Space, Invisible Invaders. So yeah, the, the main headliner of most of the 50 sci-fi movies. Oh, I know John Agar. Oh, yeah. John, I can't shut the hell up, Agar. <laughs> yep, that's him. <laughs> This is one of his last things. I did not recognize. Well, of course, I know his filmography when you know he was younger and looks much more smarmy. <laughs> and of course, I didn't recognize him when he was older. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then Twiggy, the British supermodel, who, to be fair, was a legitimate actress at this time. She was doing Broadway shows. She had won a number of awards for a number of dramas. She was already an accomplished actress by the time she did this. So I don't want to say, oh, she's just a supermodel. But she just felt so weird in this role. Mm -hmm. And it was an underwritten role. Come to think of it, yeah, it actually makes it even weirder that John Agar and Roger Corman are in this segment and not in Hair. I mean, sure, David Warner did fine as the Doctor, but for how goofy and yeah. sudden sci-fi-ish twist at the end there with the aliens, it really feels like Corman and John Agar should be in Hair versus the darker, much more creepy body possession story. Yeah, and I don't know how much of that was Toby Hooper, because I know Carpenter, despite producing this overall thing, kind of gave him free reign on that. Mm. So, yeah, no, it's just a weird segment that just never fully comes together. And yeah, that it's such a story we've seen before, especially I think there's been like five different projects that have done the same story, but involving a hand. Yeah, usually a hand or something else. I probably would have liked Hair a little bit better if Corman and Agar were in it, because then I would have felt like, oh, they're doing a send-up to that kind of goofy sci-fi kind of a thing, a, a B-movie feel kind of a thing. Well, here's a question. Do you think this could have worked better had you dropped I and expanded both Hair and Gas Station to like 40 minutes each? Maybe. I still feel that Gas Station is perfect in its current runtime, but yeah, maybe expanding things out a bit. Hair, I still feel, is already too long. Hair, I would just rewrite the ending and maybe go off in a different direction with that. Or maybe do different character stuff leading up, or have a longer period of time between him getting the new hair and then things going badly. Or get to know the Doctor a bit more, or explore, like, the, here's another patient. Because you know what other story this reminded me of? There's that anthology film, Cat's Eye. Mm. where it has that great Stephen King story, Quitters, Inc., where the guy goes to the agency to get him to quit smoking, and it all goes horribly wrong. This reminded me a lot of that in the setup. Hmm. Granted, that one, what I love about that one is it kind of stayed grounded. It never suddenly was like, aliens! And it was also just weird having that whole aliens twist so soon after we just had They Live. You know what would have been better for I to really actually give it a proper twist? What? What if actually it wasn't a serial killer possessing him? What if it turned out that he actually just had a dark side to him? Hmm. I would have liked that. I think that would have been definitely a more novel approach to it for sure. Well, you could definitely say that it was the accident that caused it, like where the trauma, uh, the trauma to the frontal lobe that yeah, does like, your hmm. personality, where it could have been that, but then he was so obsessed that it was inside that he pulls it out and then it actually doesn't do anything. He's still the same person. Yeah, exactly. What if it's his wife gaslighting him? What does that mean? What does that term mean? Oh, where she's basically trying to make him think he's going insane. Oh. That would also be a more interesting twist. What for, though? Because she's trying to get out of the relationship. She'd be a very good actor. <laughs> yeah. Maybe she, like, married this big celebrity ball player, and suddenly he can't do that anymore, so she wants out of the relationship. And mm. she wants to, like, inherit his money or something. Because they live in a pretty nice home. Yeah, so she starts fucking with him so she can have him declared insane or something. And it ties into this eye. And yeah, it could just be, yeah, there's nothing wrong with the eye. And then she could give the Bible verse at the end about plucking the eye out and casting it aside. Yep. Eye is just the odd man out for me. I don't dislike it. I think it's a good piece and I would feel guilty removing it just because it didn't well, work for me. Because it is skilled. Hmm. Yeah, no, but I think it would fit much better in, in like Tales from the Dark Side than it would here. It feels like it needed something more than what it has. Body bags after dark. It needs something more than what it has, and it's out of place with what it's around. 
it didn't work for me. And again, if I, if I ever watch this movie, I'm probably going to stop an hour in. I don't know that I'm going to rewatch this segment again. So yeah, I just rewatched Gas Station a lot more. Gas Station, yeah. 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 <laughs> again, I can't stress it enough. Watch Gas Station. It's really damn good. And then I also want to mention, we didn't mention this in any of the segments, but the music, which again, Carpenter did this time with Jim Lang, who he had never really worked with before. This is after he had just come off of an entire decade of working with Alan Howard, and that had come to an end. I like the score, what I especially loved in Hair. You just kind of had this constant jazzy guitar that reminded me a lot of Twin Peaks, mm. where it just kind of had this playful, constant energy, kind of percussion always kind of underlying the scene. Not in a tense way, but there's a kind of saunter to it that just keeps everything moving, keeps everything lively. I can definitely see that. Gas Station was more your typical Carpenter score, atmospheric, mm-hmm. sharp stings. Ding, 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 ding. ding. Yeah. <laughs> Like I said, Gas Station is really in his wheelhouse. It's the kind of story that he really does well. The person or persons alone and having to deal with stressful, tense situation, particularly being stalked. It's his wheelhouse. It's what he's best at. And it's also a strong, intriguing female character who Carpenter Hmm. excels at. Intriguing little momentary characters and moments. Strong bits of intensity. Like, I mean, honestly, what I love about the whole bit of him going up to the window with a sledgehammer it reminded me so much of the guys with the sledgehammer and Christine, where Carpenter's like, I've got my two cameras set up. Here's a sledgehammer. There's the window. Just do whatever you want for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> Go to town. <laughs> Here's a thought. Why didn't he just use the sledgehammer on the door? Because this was more theatrical. Because <laughs> I love it. It's literally just a pullback, a wide shot that encompasses the entire window. Is he just punching oh, yes. hole after hole after hole? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I know Robert Carradine who was also on the audio commentary, just had such a blast because nobody had ever let him do anything like that before. <laughs> what I will also say about I, what's interesting about I is it's one of the only times that John Carpenter has ever scored something by another director. The score didn't particularly stand out to me, but it was still interesting just hearing that. And that also that it was Gary Kibbe who was John Carpenter's cinematographer, pretty much the only films that Gary Kibbe was ever cinematographer on were the seven or ten films he did with John. And now he's working with another director. So it's just interesting seeing these carpentry elements still under a thing that's not made by John. Hmm. I do think I is intriguing in that aspect. Anyways, I, I think we pretty much covered the movie. Any like final things anyone wants to point out? Any final comments on anything? I think I'm pretty good. Overall, it's an enjoyable anthology film in its own right, and I do recommend checking it out, especially if you like Tales from the Crypt, mid-90s kind of aesthetic. Yeah. My main problem with Goosebumps, which these writers then went on to do... Now let me ask, uh, television Goosebumps or movie Goosebumps? Television. Hmm. And that was just two years after this that that started. I think my main problem with that one was they just shot it in such a weird, campy way that if some of those Goosebumps stories had been shot as well as this, like imagine if John Carpenter directed a few Goosebumps episodes. (laughs) Oh, Lord, yes. Those would have been amazing. (laughs) So here's a question. And Lewis, we'll start with you. Would Body Bags be a pilot that would make you tune in for another episode? Definitely. Alex? Gas Station would guarantee me to watching the entire season, even if nothing was as good as Gas Station. Julia? Yes, I would keep watching, but I would be wary after watching the I one. (laughs) (laughs) See, I'm usually with anthology ones is I'll just kind of wait for it to run its course and then I'll just, any directors that intrigue me, I'll just watch theirs. I still have only seen like three episodes of Masters of Horror. I try to watch an entire anthology series if only because there are unexpected gems or stuff you go back later and rewatch. Like, huh, that was actually really damn good. Yeah, there's usually an idea or two where you're like, wow, I've never seen that before. I just, I always have a hard time getting hooked into something that is not a constant story. Mm. I don't know. That's always just been a weird thing with me. Not not to criticize the anthology. That's just one of my weird quirks. It's a personal thing. My mom actually has a problem with watching anthologies as a result, especially when her and my dad tried to rewatch the 90s Outer Limits. Mm. Like, I, I have the DVDs of the entire original Outer Limits. I don't think I ever made it a full season in when I tried to. <laughs> 90s Outer Limits was actually surprisingly really damn good. It's why it lasted for so long. Plus, they actually did sequel episodes, which I always find really intriguing. Two earlier episodes in the season or to the original series? Two earlier episodes of the series. Oh, nice. I recall there's one episode where, like, the story is all about a group discovering an alien spacecraft and eventually going up into space. Then a season or two later, they did a sequel episode, which has them on the spacecraft Mm -hmm. on the way to their destination. See, and the ones that always kind of intrigue me are where the anthology stories will kind of fold in and out of one another and kind of coexist. Like, you know, there was that Trick or Treat movie that came out not so long ago, Mm. or Creepshow 3, which is a sloppy movie, but I love the mechanic of it. You don't see many of those. Yeah, where there's interlap with various anthologies. I mean, like Trick or Treat, where it's like, this is all stuff that's happening on the same street on the same night. Mm -hmm. 
I'd love to see more of that. But that's kind of a separate thing altogether. It would have been interesting to see John do more episodes of television. John has never really done episodes of television. This is like the first official episode of television John has done. Because back in the 70s, he did a few TV movies. And in the 2000s, he'll do those couple episodes of Masters of Horror. But that's only four episodes of television in his entire career. Mm. That's just kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when so many other directors from the 70s and 80s, like John Landis and Joe Dante went into TV. Toby Hooper went into TV. Wes Craven did a bunch of TV. John Badham and Rennie Harlan went and did a bunch of TV. John has never really gone the TV route, and I don't know why that is. Hmm. Seems strange. He'd be good at it. It could just be, you know, the rushed production schedules. You don't have control over final edit. Plus how many stories you have to churn out. Exactly. He is kind of a lone wolf in certain ways. Yeah, but even in the heyday of anthology shows, like the 80s and 90s, you'd think you would get, like, maybe an episode here and there. Mm-hmm. Mm. Because, I mean, like, Toby would just come and do, like, an episode of a series, you know, or something like that. Wes Craven did multiple episodes of the uh, 80s Twilight Zone. It would have been interesting to see what you would have gotten. A bunch of little gas stations out there waiting for people to explore. (laughs) And if John wasn't to host it by playing the coroner, who would you get to play the coroner? That is a very good question. Who is the actor who played the train man in the Matrix sequels? Oh, uh, Bruce Spence. The guy from Road Warrior, yeah. I could see him doing it. Especially because he's like six foot nine, so he has this imposing towering quality mixed with that kind of gaunt playfulness. Mm. Yep. I could see that. I could definitely... God, Bruce Spence is John Carpenter. That's a weird (laughs) (laughs) image. My answer is Brad Dourif. Mm. Well, the answer is always Brad (laughs) Dourif. Oh, God. Brad Dourif is an anthology show host. You know, that would actually be interesting is to open each episode with you're the coroner who drives up with the hearse to pick up the body from the scene where they died. Yeah, for sure. And so what happened? Here's what happened. And then you drive away at the end. Kind of like what the hitchhiker was supposed to be. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, I think that ultimately wraps up our discussion of body bags. Thank you very much for joining us, Lewis. No problem. Thank you for having me. Nice to talk to you. Thank you for watching. (laughs) With your eye. Uh, well, thank you for joining us, special guest, Lewis, and uh, Here's thank looking you at for you. listening. <laughs> it's a horror eye. It can listen just like it can remember. Oh my god, that's terrifying. <laughs> it's an eye covered in hair. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J A K L O C K E.com. Oh, by the way, the woman who played Anne, the same year she was in an episode of Next Generation. What episode? Descent Part 2, where she was an ensign and was wearing a blue uniform. Oh my uniform. god, yeah, she was... She, <laughs> yep. Yeah, I remember her now, huh? I figured as soon as I mentioned that, you would. <laughs> as soon as I looked her up, I'm like, oh, hey, yeah. <laughs> Nifty. She's a lot more confident in this than she was in that episode. Well, that's because she never got to walk around with a giant wrench. No, well, the episode basically features how really bass awkwards the Enterprise's staff assignments are, because <laughs> the ship is operating under a skeleton crew because most of the crew is beamed down to look for data in the Borg, and they put a blue shirt at the tactical helm. <laughs> Let's put the botanist at the station where they have to shoot things. Well, it's better than the blue shirt being at the gas station. (laughs) And thank you for listening to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. We'll see you next time when we review... Oh, God, we're doing this out of order. I don't even know. A movie. A John Carpenter movie, probably. Uh, In the Mouth of Madness. We're doing In the Mouth of Madness next. Oh, that's a good one. I mean, is it? Stay tuned.